If, if a porch light is what welcomes you home, what is the light for a skyscraper? How does that welcome you? Well, how, what is that saying? If, if a skyscraper is the porch of a city, what does that light feel like? What, is it, what does it want to feel like? What I mean by facades is the outer skin of a building. Um, so whether that um, is, a, is the actual glazing, whether it's a curtain wall, whether there are, um, whether it has any shapes or a screen on the front of it, it's the actual outer skin of the building. Our purpose when we light a facade is to um, allow that building and the people who are involved in that building to express themselves at this scale. When we get asked to light the facade of a building, any type of building, I begin to think of uh, the people in the building, the people who own the building, the people who are building the building, what are they trying to say with this building? The architects, the developers, the owners, what are they trying to say? And so can, and so because at some point, some level, that building speaks for them. And it speaks to whom? Whom does it speak? Does it speak to, um, you know, is it a small, uh, humble building? Is it a 60-story tower? Is it, where is it located? Um, will it speak to an entire city? What is its aspirations? Um, basically, what are the aspirations of all those people involved in its uh, inception? So once I, I understand what they're trying to convey, I start to work out, okay, what is the best way to do that? Um, when you're called to light a facade, it is, uh, it needs to sit within the architecture. Uh, that's a key part of both of these, that it is that the light is integrated. So when we think about lighting um, one of the, uh, a facade, the first thing we must consider is how to integrate that light. And there's different ways we go about managing that expression or uh, facilitating that expression. And so we think, I think of two main ways that we do that. And one is by articulating the form of the building and the other is by dematerializing that form. And we do both with light. To articulate the form is fairly straightforward. It is um, the architecture has a form to it. Um, and we can outline the um, we can outline that form, or we can graze that form with light, so that the light at night um, serves to define the architecture. Not only the the actual form and the materiality of the architecture, but the intent. So um, certain buildings want to be uh, lit more fully. Other buildings want just want uh, moments of them lit. Um, so that's how we articulate the form, either by tracing some of the, the lines of the architecture or lighting some of the solids. Um, so that's how we articulate it. The opposite is this dematerialization and um, that is when, at night, when the lights are on, we can make them, uh, they seem to move through the content we play on them. Um, and that, you start to see the lights, not the building. And that's when the building starts to move or n not necessarily change shape, but seem to kind of dematerialize. It doesn't have the same density, doesn't have the same form. Um, 
it, it starts to dematerialize. And why that's important, in my view, is that uh, our cities are currently filled with forms that don't really reflect who we are, and there's a density to them that um, yeah feels dark and dull and dense, and the light um, counteracts that, and I think that makes our cities more habitable, more livable, more um, appealing to humans. The designs themselves um, have the ability to do both. So it depends what we do with the content. So one design can at once uh, articulate the facade and then the way the content shifts, it dematerializes. So it's not like we do a design to do one or the other. They All designs have the capability to do both. Lighting has been to date largely an afterthought to a development or to a building or to a process. And my view is that has to shift, that has to become integrated into the very design before the building is, is realized or conceived. How will it be lit? I see light becoming a like a material like a, a building material so that you have, um, you know, you have bricks and mortar and concrete and wood and steel and et cetera, and you have light. And so where will the light go? It's not like let's build a building and then we'll light it or we'll figure out where to put the lights after the building's designed. No, the light is the building and the building is the light. So I think of building l buildings as just building large-scale light fixtures. So, the, so we're not lighting the building, we're making the buildings luminous. And, so, and that's inside and out. I think this is, is the, next, the next iteration of media architecture. We're now evolved to an, a highly controllable light source. It's very controllable. We can control the color, the beam angle, the um, color temperature, the dimming curve, all of these technical characteristics of light that we, um, we can now access with such fine precision. The lights can be so small. They can be integrated anywhere. Um, you can submerse them. You can put them at 60 stories high and they can withstand winds. They can withstand UV light for long periods of time. They're waterproof. There's so much about this technology that is open to uh, deeply considered design. Resolution of the fixture and resolution of the overall design on the building um, is an important consideration. And so what I mean by the resolution on the overall building is how many lights do you put per meter or per square meter on the facade? How many pixels? Resolution is determined by, mainly by viewing distance. Um, so if, if, you, if you want to um, see an image or a movement without any pixelation, you have to be X amount of meters back. And uh, the rule of thumb is one millimeter between pixels, you have to be one meter back. So if there's 10 mil between pixels, you have to be 10 meters back. On a facade, it's not that big a problem because people generally would be hundreds of meters back just to see it. So, and you see no pixelation from that. Um, when you see the pixelation, the technology is revealed. It's like you've drawn the curtain back and you, you see the, uh, the technology. And, and that's not a good feeling because it, 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 
um, it reveals the workings. It's like when you can tell how the magic trick's done. On a big building, so one we're doing in China at the moment is there's 28 kilometers of light. And if we go below 25 millimeter pitch, we're going to go over an 8K content. So there we're going to be into 10, 12, 16K content. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, it doesn't, that doesn't make sense for the workflow. So the three considerations are um, creating the facade, uh, creating the lighting array on the facade so there's enough space for the building to breathe, for the facade to breathe, for the lights to, um, uh, to essentially um, develop their own presence on the building. And that's one. The other one is the, uh, the movement, the quality of movement of that fixture. Um, and the third is the type of uh, the resolution of the content that we would have to produce on that fixture. There was a project just recently we launched um, called 80 Collins Street, which is um, here in Melbourne. And what we, the idea of that building from the architects and the developers was that it, it would present itself like a lantern um, that has facets. This particular one wanted to glint and, and shine um, just in moments. It didn't want to be overlit. Um, and we, there had a, it has a, quite a faceted um, facade and it's like cut like a diamond. So you see different reflections and refractions from light in the city. And so we wanted to, um, to integrate our light into those facets. And so we put the lights on the inside of the building so that they feel integrated. They feel like they're coming from the building because they are. Um, and we outlined the facets. And if you turn it all on, it's quite dramatic and less powerful than if you only use each type of geometry on its own. So there's diagonals in both ways, there's verticals and there's horizontals. And so if I bring all of them on, it looks too full, too uh, not enough space. And, but when we use them individually, you can't quite tell what is the building and what is the light and what is the city. It's really kind of ephemeral. And that allows the dematerialization. We, we made these geometries to articulate that form, and the way we use them is largely to dematerialize. <laughs> 888 Collins is another one, which is just down the road a ways, um, was more um, that we modified the facade of that to accept the lights in a recess. And so those were very diffused, where 80 columns was not diffused. We want it to, to, to sparkle, so we, we didn't diffuse it. Um, whereas 888, we want it to, to have a softness, a gentleness. Um, 888 is surrounded by residential buildings, so it was important that that light didn't impose on them. If it's on full, you see the, you see the building articulated, but it's rarely full. It kind of moves as the weather moves. It's uh, linked to the weather, um, and the weather determines, the temperature determines the color, the moisture determines vertical motion, and the wind makes it move in a turbulent way. And it moves so slowly and quite sparsely at times that then you're just seeing moments of the building. So the building you don't, so your eye is drawn to the light and not to the form. And so then that, that provides just moments of space in the city.
as a new designer, or an old designer, um, if we're going to design lights and structures for public space, um, we have a responsibility. And that begins at the design stage. So it's a key part of how we work at Ramus, is the continual opening of ourselves to what is needed. What does the project need? What does the community need? What sort of light, what sort of quality of experience um, is needed here? It's not necessarily what my designers want or what I want. It's what the project needs. It's what the community needs. And so I constantly have to open myself to get rid of um, expectations, attachments, biases that I may have that color the way I think and the color of the way I design. I believe what is, there, what is needed is already there. So it is a process of re revelation. We want to reveal what the design needs to be. So my responsibility as a designer is to not get in the way of that process, but to support it and guide it and help it to be revealed. So that is a very different way of thinking about design in, in general. It's not the designer knows best. It's the designer is there to shepherd the design into life, to give it life, to animate it, and animate to mean to bring life to, so that what is already there. Don't get in the way. Don't think you know best. Study, learn your, your craft, and then get out of the way. Bring what, you, bring what you know to be true and not what you think you know is needed. Find what's needed in the project because it's right there in front of you. <laughs>